Um, I have a lot to say and not enough time, so I put a lot of the information on the World Wide Web with the science and the details and the research and the articles. If people are interested, you have the website. Um, where has this all gone wrong? And I ask myself, when I look at the Willingham case, as tragic as it may be, if it represents very special circumstances that happen once in a blue moon, it's not interesting and not important. I want to know if there's something in this case that illustrates something that happened all the time, every day across the country. And I'm going to put forward to you, yes, this case illustrates a big problem, but the problem is not in forensic evidence. Let me say it again, it's not in forensic evidence. For the most part, forensic evidence is very good. There's a much bigger problem that happens all the time the psychology of violating evidentiary independence. What happens, you have a lot of information coming in. It can be to the judge or to the jury. It can be to the uh, prosecutor. It can be to the detective. And this information flows uh, to the decision makers, to the people who uh, think about the case. You have fingerprint evidence. You have DNA evidence comes in and a whole variety of forensic evidence. We don't have to list all the forensic evidence that comes in. You have eyewitness testimony, you may have a confessions, and you have a whole variety of evidence that you know very well we don't have to list the vast majority of evidence that comes in. And then somebody has to sum it all up and to wait all together to decide if you have a case, if you convict somebody, and the person accumulating the information, the detective, needs to have a hypothesis and to decide what to do. And not only that is good, it cannot be any different way. And when they weigh the evidence together, they're subjective, and that's good. Somebody can say, well, a fingerprint evidence and DNA evidence is, I think, much stronger than bite mark evidence. Or they can say eyewitnesses is not very reliable, or I just looked at the, uh, you know, the eyewitness and I don't believe them. And that's fine for the detective and the jury and the judge to do. There's no problem with that. And the same with confessions and so on and so forth. This is all fine and good. The problem is for it to work, each one of those lines of evidence must be independent and not contaminated. And there's a lot of contamination of this evidence and that, I put to you, happens not in a rare case, once in a blue moon, like the Willingham case, as tragic it may be, but happens every day across the country and around the world. What am I talking about? For example, eyewitnesses. So we have taken quite a lot of steps. We know when somebody has an eyewitness lineup, we can't say to them, well, number four is who I believe it is, because that's going to influence the eyewitness. When you interview them, it doesn't take a lot. All you have to say, are you sure about that? And even if you don't say anything, the tones of your question, your uh, mannerism affects the eyewitnesses. There's even a lot of debate in lineup whether they should be double blind. Not only the eyewitness cannot know in the lineup who the suspect is, but even the person conducting the lineup, the detective, should be somebody else who doesn't know who the suspect is because there's a lot of non-verbal communication, the Rosenthal effect, the Pygmalion effect. There's a lot of contamination. If you think that only eyewitnesses, naive people who are not experts can be contaminated, well, think again. Even fingerprint and DNA evidence can be contaminated. For example, uh, if you present a pair of fingerprints, and we've done that, and fingerprint examiners have to determine it's a match or not match, based on the fingerprints, and you present it in a different context. In one context, they know that the person confessed to the crime or the eyewitness testimony against them, or the detective believes that it's a match or it's taken from a high-profile emotional case, versus presenting in a different context. Again, nothing to do with the actual fingerprints. You find that they reach different conclusions. This is very disturbing when we found out that it's not two different examiners, but the same examiner, the same person presented with the same fingerprint in a different context, a few years apart, reach a different conclusion because of the context. And it's all on the web, all the data, it's published research. 
and let me tell you DNA too. I need to qualify it and say mixture DNA is also susceptible to that. And we're talking about criminal cases where this uh, happens. For example, look at this uh, US case. I took off the details because I'm not here to embarrass any detective or any bureau. It's a problem that goes across the board. So here's a lot of contextual information. First of all, in the request that the detective is making to the fingerprint examiner, it says it's a homicide, that the examiner needs to know it's a homicide? Maybe. Then it's a black man killing a white person. Is that relevant? Maybe, I don't know. But if you go down to the very uh, bottom, I can't read, I don't know if you can read here, but it says uh, this person pulled the trigger. Please make every effort to identify them. And not only that, it said that the only other witness in the truck was too drunk to identify. So you're the only evidence, if not uh, somebody is gone. This may influence and contaminate the evidence for this context that affects a lot uh, of issues. And I have a, a real case in the US on DNA evidence uh, similar to that where it affected the results. 